Okay, good afternoon and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for the Johns Hopkins School of Education virtual information session. This afternoon's session will focus on program and admissions information for our postmaster certificate in applied behavior analysis. We are really excited to have you here with us today to share some of the exciting opportunities that this dynamic program has to offer. My name is Elizabeth Woodward and I serve as the Director of Admissions here at the School of Education. I'm joined this afternoon by our Faculty Director for Applied Behavior Analysis, Dr. Tamara Martyr, and two of our alumni and practitioners in the field of Applied Behavior Analysis, Leslie Coleman and Jackie Devon. I'll be introducing our uh, presenters shortly. Before we get started, just wanna, I would like to cover a few logistical items for today's presentation. First, I just uh, would like to let everyone know that today's webinar is being recorded. The admissions office will make the recording uh, available on our website after the event, should you wish to review it again, or maybe even share it with a friend or colleague who may also be interested in our Applied Behavior Analysis Postmaster Certificate. We ask that you please take a moment to make certain that your microphone is muted and your video camera is off during the presentation. At the conclusion of today's session, we will invite you to ask questions of our presenters and of myself from admissions using our chat function. Together with Dr. Martyr and our alumni presenters, uh, we will read and answer your questions aloud um, and hopefully give you a little bit more information and insight. Um, here's a quick view of today's agenda and the information that we will be covering uh, to start us off. I will be providing a brief overview of Johns Hopkins University and the School of Education. I will then turn the presentation over to our uh, faculty presenter, Dr. Martyr, and our alumni speakers. And toward the end of the session, I'll return to cover some important next steps about the application process, tuition, financial aid, and scholarships. And then we'll conclude with the question and answer period um, where you'll be able to enter your questions into chat. So Johns Hopkins University as a whole enrolls uh, more than 24,000 full-time and part-time students across nine academic divisions or schools and has three campuses, our flagship campus in Baltimore City, which is called our Homewood Campus, as well as classroom uh, building locations throughout Greater Baltimore and DC region. Established in 2007, uh, the Johns Hopkins School of Education is the youngest of uh, the university's nine divisions and has quickly taken its place as a national leader in educational reform and innovation. Grounded in Johns Hopkins tradition of research and evidence-based practice, the School of Education consistently ranks among the top graduate schools of education in the nation uh, by US News and World Report, and the university as a whole by the Times Higher Education World University ranking, uh, ranked number 16. So over the past 13 years, the school has really grown its mission to train teachers, school leaders, counselors, and practitioners to meet contemporary challenges of teaching and learning. Today, the school has 127 full-time faculty, 2,465 enrolled students across 30 degree programs. And these degree programs span from initial teacher preparation to counselor education, interdisciplinary programs, and advanced studies programs, which include our doctoral programs as well as our autism and applied behavior analysis programs that are a focus of today's session. So the purpose of today is really twofold. First is to give you the overview of the curriculum, uh, internships, practicums, all the information, kind of nuts and bolts, including the admissions process. But perhaps more importantly and second is to connect you with our faculty and our alumni who can share with you firsthand testimony of what their learning experience in the program was like, as well as current research trends and how they are applying what they've learned in their field. The session is a chance and we encourage you to engage and ask questions at the conclusion of the presentation. And we hope that you find today's session useful and look forward to receiving your completed application for our upcoming fall 2020 semester, which begins at the end of August. So it's coming up. If you are interested in starting this fall, we strongly encourage you to start the application process as soon as possible because we're getting very close to the start. 
And the admissions office, myself and Dr. Martyr are here to assist you in navigating the process following today's presentation. Um, please keep in mind that this is a fall admit only program. So after fall 2020, fall 2021 would be the next admissions period open. I would now like to introduce you to our first presenter, Dr. Um, Tamara Martyr. Uh, Dr. Martyr serves as an associate professor for the Applied Behavior Analysis, Autism, and Severe Disabilities programs. She is a licensed educational psychologist and a board certified behavior analyst. She has worked in the field of applied behavior analysis for 26 years and has extensive experience working with children with developmental disabilities and families in a variety of settings, including schools, homes, and hospitals. Her research interests include improving learning outcomes for students with developmental disabilities and autism through effective training and preparation of educator, educators and professionals who provide these services. In 2015, Dr. Martyr received our prestigious Excellence in Teaching Award from Johns Hopkins University Alumni Association. So with that, I will turn the presentation over to Dr. Martyr. Thank you, Liz. Welcome, everybody. I'm so glad to see you here virtually. Um, I want to start off in talking about our program just to take a few seconds to talk about applied behavior analysis. Obviously, if you're interested in this program and applying to this program, you are familiar with what applied behavior analysis is. But here's just a few bullets to share. Um, when we think about uh, what applied behavior analysis is, it is the scientific study of the principles of learning and behavior. So why do humans behave the way that they do? What motivates their behavior? What increases their behavior? And it's a systematic approach for applying the principles of learning to improve socially important behavior for all individuals. When we're thinking about um, working in schools, it's looking at applying these principles of learning to improve those skills and behaviors that we want our students to learn in an educational K through 12 setting. Also, as you're aware of this program, we do um, graduate students who are eligible, eligible to become board certified behavior analysts. Um, so to become a board certified behavior analyst or a BCBA, this is a graduate level certification in behavior analysis. Um, and so you can see, you can check out more information from the BACB.com website, which is our behavior analyst certification board. We can do the next slide, please. Okay, so what is ABA? You know, I get this question a lot, and um, this is straight from, again, the BACB website. So a lot of folks, you know, may be concerned about where they currently work. Maybe they're in a public school setting or a non-public school setting, and they're concerned, you know, well, we don't do ABA in my school, or we're not doing discrete trial instruction in my school, so I'm not sure we're doing ABA. And so in front of you is a list of lots of different skills that practitioners of behavior analysts provide or practice. And so you can see this list and I'm sure many of you who have joined us today can see different aspects on this list of practices they do every day at school from conducting behavioral assessments and functional behavior assessments, looking at data and making decisions, training others on behavior programs or behavior intervention plans, supervising others on the implementation of those plans. So um, if you look at uh, the Behavior Analyst Certification Board, you see that we are moving into the fifth edition task list, which is an, an entire task list of all the skills um, that a behavior analyst needs to um, employ and use. And so um, all of these areas come under what is ABA. So I, I recommend that you check out that task list to see all the different things that go into becoming a B board certified behavior analyst. Okay, we can move on. Okay, so let's talk about the program. Um, our program is designed for educators. So special educators, general educators, coordinators of uh, special education programs, administrators, school psychologists, and school counselors. Um, students who come through our program will learn the evidence-based practice of ABA to meet the growing needs of students in the K through 12 setting, specifically in special education. And it also supports those career goals of um, professionals who want to get this specialized training. Our courses are um, encompass seven courses or 21 credits. We also include in our course sequence four practicum elective courses. I'm gonna talk about practicum very soon in a few minutes. Um, 
but um, so there's a total of 11 courses that would be needed to become board certified, but we provide the seven courses as part of our graduate certificate in behavior analysis that will enable graduates to be eligible to sit for the BCBA exam. Our faculty are also all board certified behavior analysts. Um, and we can go on to the next slide. Another important thing for any uh, graduate school or graduate program in behavior analysis is the verification from the ABAI, the Association for Behavior Analysis International. ABAI verifies all of the courses and they have verified our coursework since its inception in 2013. Um, we are now, um, for the students who are coming into the fall 2020 cohort, um, we will all be under the new fifth edition requirements. And so uh, the ABAI has just recently verified our coursework for the fifth edition, which is a very important piece because if you're applying to become board certified, you sort of need that stamp of approval from ABAI to say that, yes, all these courses, when you apply to the BACB, um, yes, all the courses were verified and this student is eligible to sit for the exam. Okay, next slide. So what does our curriculum look like? Um, candidates complete all courses in the practicum ele electives. So all of the courses that were listed, the 11 courses, including the electives, within six semesters, so that's three years, by taking two courses each semester. Our courses are offered in the evening, um, so it's very, um, very practical for folks who work full time and then um, take courses in the evening. And they're all uh, offered in a central location in Columbia. I will say for the fall semester, all of our courses will be online due to the pandemic, um, but typically our, our courses are offered on campus face-to-face uh, -face with the instructors. Our practicum experiences, again, which are electives, are planned according to your current place of employment as long as you are practicing or able to provide ABA services. So think back to that list that I provided um, on that second slide that talked about what are the skills a behavior analyst needs to practice um, or what um, a practitioner of ABA encompasses. Um, and so if you are able to practice those um, skills, we can provide you with a practicum experience in your place of employment. If that's not possible, which is sometimes the case, we have a wonderful practicum coordinator who will work with all of our students to ensure that their placements are um, appropriate for this type of training. Okay, next slide. So this is uh, the course sequence. Again, it's over three years um, looking at all of the courses. It's important to remember here too that the practicum courses are electives. So if you choose not to take the practicum courses and just take the seven courses, you could finish up in two years this program. So you can see you could swap out on the fall semester for year two and three. You could combine those and do behavioral assessment and applications of ABA in the classroom. So, um, but if you're looking to get the practicum courses, this would be the three-year program. The first semester, I always joke around, is like moving to a new country and learning a new language because you really spend the time in the introduction course to really talk about all these principles of cons and concepts of behavior analysis and really get a clear understanding of what they are. And also in the first semester, you take a course on research methods um, which, um, although the focus is on research, this is single subject design, the focus is really on how do we measure behavior and how do we ensure that the plans that we're putting into place or programs that we are teaching our students are effective. So it's how do we collect data and how do we make evidence-based decisions or database decisions on the data that we collect. The second semester of the um, first year, we move into behavioral assessment of interve and intervention for challenging behaviors. So this is the course where we're really understanding what is a functional behavior assessment, what's a functional analysis, and how do I create and develop function-based treatments or interventions for students. The second course that semester will be Ethics and Professional Conduct, which is a really exciting and fun class. We talk about all the typical ethical, uh, ethical considerations or ethical scenarios that you may come across as a behavior analyst. And this course also helps you develop what your professional conduct as a behavior analyst would be. 
we do not offer courses in the summer. So the second year we move into the fall semester where we look at behavioral assessment and instructional strategies. So this is really looking at skill acquisition. How do we assess our students' current skills? Um, how do we make programming changes to teach new behaviors and new skills? A lot of the times you will see at other universities, you may have the behavioral assessment course encompass both skill acquisition as well as behavior reduction like we have in the first semester, uh, the second semester of the first year with the, the challenging behaviors course. We decided to separate those two courses out even though they really do go together in practice um, as uh, practitioners, as behavior analysts, but we like to separate them out because we want to be able to spend the time focusing on just behavior reduction and just on skill acquisition. It's important to separate those two out. So that's, that's a, um, a unique piece of our program in the way that we offer these courses. In the fall semester of the second year, you can also enroll in the elective practicum. I'm going to talk about that, I promise, in the next few slides. And then the second uh, semester, the spring semester of the second year, we move into our newest course, which is our newest requirement, which is the Supervision and Consultation Practices course in ABA. This is going to be the cohort that's coming in this fall. This will be the first cohort that will be experiencing this course. We're super excited about this course. Um, in our last seven years of offering this program, this is definitely the area that um, I feel as faculty is definitely missing from what we've had to offer previously because we really look at how do we supervise others. We can write great behavior intervention plans. Um, we can write great instructional programming, but how do we supervise others to implement those plans and how do we get them to implement them with fidelity? How do we work as a team? So that's consultation, collaboration, and how do we supervise others? So we're super excited to offer that course for the first time um, in this next coming upcoming cohort. And then finally, in the third year, we move into the final full course, which is the applications of ABA in the classroom. And in that course, uh, we accomplish two things. One, um, this is really a seminar course where we're looking at specific issues within education and applied behavior analysis. And we delve into those issues on a weekly basis um, with um, an intensity laser focus on those specific topics. Um, the second half of that class is focused on how do you prepare or how do we prepare for the behavior analyst exam, the BCBA exam. So we talk about different strategies, how to prepare, and each week we spend time looking at preparing for the exam. You could also take the, whoops, if you could go back one more slide, back to the course sequence, thank you. Um, you could also do the practicum three elective that semester. And then the final, um, if you are doing all the practicum courses with us, the final semester is just the one practicum elective. Okay, now we can move on. Um, before you on this slide is the specific learning outcomes, um, which goes into detail. Uh, it's kind of repetitive of all the things I've talked about already, but it's really looking at how do we understand these concepts of principles of uh, behavior analysis, concepts and principles, and how do we apply them? How do we use research methods to evaluate those um, procedures? Um, how do we conduct behavioral assessments? How do we intervene to decrease behaviors? Um, to decrease excess behaviors and to increase deficits or increase skills or behaviors that we want to see. How do we evaluate all of those programs? How do we practice within the ethical guidelines um, and responsible conduct as defined by the BACB? And then um, how do we um, implement, manage, and practice in an educational setting behavior analysis? And then finally, um, successful completion, the ultimate um, outcome from this program is these um, sitting for the behavior analyst certification BCBA exam. Okay, next slide. So let's talk a few minutes about practicum. If you are familiar with our program um, from previous years, the practicum courses were not electives, they were actually part of the program. So in order to graduate from the JHU ABA program at Hopkins, you would also have to take two practicum courses. With the cohort coming in this semester, we've made all of the courses um, electives. So you can choose to take any of the four courses. The um, new experience standards that are coming out as of January 2022, which would um, be applicable for all folks coming into the program in the fall, requires 1,500 hours total. This is an increase to the previous requirements. 
Um, so it's 1,500 hours total. So you can complete the, pro, the practicum over four semesters at Johns Hopkins and um, have all of the required 1,500 hours. Those 1,500 hours um, that we will um, provide in our practicum courses align with the concentrated experience fieldwork as outlined by the BACB. Um, if you are familiar with the practicum, you know that there are two types of requirements to get these fieldwork experience hours, um, just experience fieldwork or the concentrated. We offer the concentrated, which is a bit shorter amount of hours so it's a difference of 500 hours. So 2000 is the supervised experience field work and we offer 1500 hours according to the BACB requirements. Um, but the concentrated means that you actually get more supervision. So the concentrated piece is that you are actually supervised uh, twice per week. Um, so coming back to the left hand side of my slide here, our um, supervision, um, the way that we provide supervision is the application of behavior analytic services in an educational setting. I think I mentioned we have a wonderful practicum coordinator who is the, the liaison between our practicum sites and the faculty who teach the practicum courses. The practicum electives not only provide the supervision hours, but we also, uh, the individual supervision hours, we also provide group supervision with a course, a one hour course per week where um, you are provided, you get to speak with your cohort and find out from them what they are learning in their practicum site. And we provide all of the guidance to figure out all of these hours that you have to accrue and how to account for all of those hours uh, during the practicum. Okay, we can move on to the next one. Some additional information, um, upon successful completion of all seven courses, students will receive a postmaster certificate in ABA from Johns Hopkins. If you then go on to finish the four elective practicum courses on top of the seven courses, you would be eligible to apply for the BACB to the BACB for the certification, the BCBA certification. Students are responsible for applying and supplying all supporting evidence and documentation to the BACB. We don't schedule that for you. We don't um, apply for you. That is something the students must do. Students who go through the program, we don't provide the certification. You must apply to the BACB to get that certification. It's also an expectation that students who enroll in our program here will pursue that certification. Even if they're not doing the practicum hours with us, um, there's that expectation that it's not that you just take the seven courses and then you can call yourself a behavior analyst. It is super important that everybody has the practicum experience that is part of the certification requirements by the BACB, but not only that, it allows you to really practice as a behavior analyst and get that supervision um, from another behavior analyst to make sure that not only do you have the knowledge from taking the courses, but you're able to apply that knowledge in a practical setting. So now I'd like to move on to our alumni. So we have Leslie Coleman. She's going to introduce herself and say a little bit about her experience. And then uh, we're also lucky to have Jackie Devin who will speak after Leslie. So Leslie, I'll turn it over to you. Hi, thank you, Dr. Martyr. I'm so excited to be here with you all today. Um, my name is Leslie Coleman. I am a behavior specialist. I work in Anne Arundel County Public Schools. My role currently is I support, um, I support special educators in the, with, and serving students diagnosed with ADHD and emotional disabilities in their gen ed settings. But most of my experience has actually been working with uh, in early intervention with young students with autism spectrum disorders. Um, so just a few things that was just the bullets to highlight my experience with uh, at Johns Hopkins in this program. I originally I wanted to join this program and I applied because I was always fascinated with behavior specifically and behavior change and working with children with autism specifically behavior change and skill acquisition was such a critical piece of my work. And as you know, successful and meaningful behavior change um, resulted in life changing opportunities, not only for the kids, but for their families. So I was, that's what was my motivation for joining the program. What surprised me most was that I really didn't know as, as much as I thought I did when I first entered. And I truly learned more in this program than I ever thought that I could. The experience was actually truly humbling. 
um, where I was, I can say that I was really well versed in delivering specialized instruction to the young students in my classroom. It wasn't until I really began applying behavior anal analytic work uh, during my first year, uh, during my second year in my practicum, that I really was using this new skill set that I developed and was incredibly prepared for by Johns Hopkins. Um, you know, and with conducting functional behavior assessments, developing behavior intervention plans, making those database decisions, coaching teachers and delivering feedback to them on their intervention plans. All of this was a new set of skills that, um, that the coursework absolutely prepared me for. And the motivation to continue learning in this field has been undeniable for me as I continue to research articles and, become, and just continue being very excited about applied behavior analysis which I actually never thought possible. I was, that, that was truly the biggest surprise um, for me. The faculty uh, it was not only just so knowledgeable, every, all of the faculty had a very different approach to teaching, um, but it's so knowledgeable in their craft and extremely supportive. Always, I think the, the best, the most amazing thing I can say about the faculty is that everybody was always available, always available to answer questions. And, and so supportive. Um, it's a very, very difficult program. Uh, so well worth it, but the professors know how difficult it is and are always there to be there and answer questions in a timely manner. And um, I will continue to seek all of my professors out in the future for advice and support as hopefully a new BCBA after October 16th when I take my exam. Um, finally, the coursework is very, laid out very well. Um, I loved how the coursework Built, you know, built off of each other where we really, um, the first semester really laid a foundation for what was to come. Um, and each course sort of, it was laid on top, it was like brickwork almost. And, and you really kept learning from, from the previous, previous semester. It, 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 was, it was laid out very sequentially, very well, well laid out that we use our, our foundational knowledge that we were, built, that we were building from. And um, that's really all I have to have to say right now. And those are my, my highlights and my bullets. Um, the only other thing was that I looked forward to going to class every night. I looked forward to um, seeing the, my cohort, which to be honest, there are those in my cohort who became almost like a, a family to me. We were supporting each other and being there to answer questions and help each other through. So again, that was another big surprise was that everybody who you know applies for this program and and is willing to go through this work? We're all we all were in it together, and it was very. I I believe that I will have these relationships probably for the rest of my life as as colleagues and friends. So uh, that's really all that I have to say. Is if there's anything else, I'm happy to answer questions at the end. Hi everybody, um, I'm Jackie. Um, Leslie, let me just start off, you did a phenomenal job. Um, and I'll kind of like recap my own um, feelings, but Leslie did an excellent job really um, setting me up. So thanks Leslie, and also thank you Dr. Martyr and everyone for having me here today. Um, so let me talk a little bit about myself. So I'm a special education teacher in Baltimore County Public Schools. Um, I have, I've primarily done self-contained there, um, primar primarily with students with autism, but I have had quite a bit of an ex experience with students with um, a range of disabilities um, and kind of just like different levels of, of learners. So um, just in general, I feel that I really can't speak highly enough of the program. Um, I feel that Dr. Martyr, um, the rest of the faculty, and Johns Hopkins really, really sets everybody up for success that um, is a member of their program. Um, in regards to being prepared for my position, I, I was a good teacher, um, and that kind of came naturally to me, but what I wasn't really very good at was being prepared to communicate a lot of the needs and the behaviors of my students prior to beginning this program. Um, there's, as a special educator, I'm sure some of you may already know this, you're working with a lot of different colleagues, you're working with your speech therapist, your OT, um, your general education teacher, your admin, your parents. Um, and while I really felt like I understood my students, I wasn't really effective at communicating that. But what the um, foundation that 
this program has given me was really being able to um, put into words what I'm actually doing with them and be able to articulate that better to um, really give my students um, more success. Um, as well as um, if you are a self contained teacher or even a special ed teacher, you know you're working with a lot of staff, maybe your paraeducators or adult assistants. Um, and what everybody always says as a teacher is that nobody prepares you for how to train these adults that you might have in your classroom. But with this program, it really sets you up. Um, part of being becoming a BCBA is there's such a huge part about training your staff. And I'm so glad to hear that one of the new courses being incorporated will be learning about supervision. But um, I really feel like this program has really given me the opportunity to be more prepared to train my staff on student protocols and being able for them to implement that, those protocols within my classroom, but also outside of my classroom, maybe when they're in general education or perhaps um, in special area classes or around other places around the building. I also can't speak highly enough about um, really understanding that I've learned so much about identifying what truly is the function of, um, of my students' behaviors. Um, I knew I, I was okay at kind of making uh, behavior plans that seemed like they were working and they were working, but I didn't understand why. Um, because I really couldn't identify the function before, or at least I, I might have thought I was, but I wasn't. Um, but after completing this program, I, and even just starting it, like a couple semesters in, and after that um, first year, I really felt like that's all I could think about. What is the function of this? Being really able to identify that. Um, as well as collecting um, meaningful data um, that's measurable um, in that research design course. I, just unbelievable. The faculty that you will uh, experience during your time at Hopkins, honestly, they're the most passionate and truly experienced experts in the field. Um, and they're supportive and encouraging and they want you to be successful. Um, and I, I feel like even with our faculty, we've really grown a family. Um, they wanna bring you into their field um, and build you up to be just as successful as they are. And I can't speak highly enough, and I know Leslie already um, said this, but the coursework in the program is, everything is mean meaningful. And it's really built also on the principles of ABA. Um, or, and you're, you're watching it all play out and everything is meaningful and thought out. And it's truly remarkable. And I don't think that all programs um, for in ABA are, are developed like that. So I think it's top notch. Um, but just in regards to uh, what finishing the program and getting ready to um, sit for the exam in October, I, I can't, I wouldn't have anticipated taking away the professionalism that, that you gain while during your time in this program. Um, and just how my outlook generally speaks speaking on the world has been able to change through, through understanding the principles of ABA and kind of, it's not just about my students and ident identifying the function of their behaviors, but taking a look at those people around me in general and how to apply that to other people that I'm working with and just communicating with daily. But um, again, I can't say enough great things about this program. Um, I'm so happy to be here and answer any questions that you guys may have. I wish everybody a ton of luck, um, and and it will be hard work, but it's so rewarding and worth it um, for everything that you will learn and do. So thank you. Thanks, Leslie, and thank you, Jackie. That was awesome. It's great to hear from you guys about the program and hear your thoughts. Um, I just want to summarize a few other advantages of the program on top of what Leslie and Jackie were already talking about. Um, one advantage is that the focus of this program is ABA in education, specifically looking at K through 12. We are not a program that is just focused on autism, um, which a lot of ABA programs are. We, we focus on all types of disabilities, um, from autism, emotional disabilities, severe disabilities, intellectual disabilities. 
Um, we've had students go through our program who apply behavior analysis and in inclusion settings. And um, we, it is important to know that we are the only graduate school in Maryland, only graduate school of education in Maryland that offers a specialized certificate, really focusing in on ABA in an educational setting. Another advantage of our program is the practicum experience. We talked about how we're moving into electives. Our practicum experience really follows a very specific curriculum and builds on the skills that you learn each semester and applies what you've learned in the previous semesters into your practicum experience. As you guys saw from the course sequence that we reviewed, the practicum experience does not start until the second year of the program. According to the BACB requirements, you can actually start accruing hours the minute you enroll in a course. We decided not to offer our practicum experience or practicum courses until the second year of the program. We have a lot of principles and concepts and practices under your belt that you've worked on in the classroom, in the graduate classroom, that you then apply in the second year into your practicum experience. The other piece of the practicum that's important to point out um, is that it is very individualized. Although we set up a, um, we do have a course curriculum we follow for the practicum, it is individualized based on our graduate students' experience. So just like we start out with all of our uh, students in education, um, in a K through 12 education, we assess, right? So we assess current skills. So we start out the practicum by assessing current skills and then building from there. Um, the other piece that I wanna mention about the practicum is that we have a group of wonderful supervisors who are board certified behavior analysts in throughout the state of Maryland who have signed on to become supervisors with us. We train those supervisors um, and it's an excellent group that, um, that continues to provide supervision to all of our students year after year. Another advantage of the program, if you can jump back one slide. Another advantage of the program, thanks, is that um, our students pass the exam. So we pass above the national pass rate. Um, as of May 2020, we've had 51 graduates take the exam and 50 have passed. That's a 98% pass rate. That's first and second time takers of the exam. Um, the 2019, every year the BACB reports out uh, pass rates across the universities. The pass rate in 2019 was 63% and we were still passing, our students were still passing the first time they took the exam at a rate higher than the national average. Um, I think I already talked about all the faculty who are board certified behavior analysts, but also I want to point out that um, not only are they BCBAs, but they are BCBAs who are out in the field practicing ABA every single day in their own, um, their own positions in the field. Okay, next slide. Um, impact of the program, we've had 76 students who've graduated from this program. So we started this program in 2013. Um, the students coming in this fall would be our eighth cohort. Um, they represent a variety of educational professionals. Kind of went over this at the beginning. We also represent 11 different school systems across Maryland and DC. Um, we are looking forward to growing those systems. We are, there are many more school systems in our area that we would like to include um, in, our, um, in our cohorts, our future cohorts. Of the six cohorts, so um, Leslie and Jackie were just graduates of our sixth cohort. 50 graduates are now board certified in behavior analysis. 31 are licensed behavior analysts in the state of Maryland. So if you're familiar with licensing in the state of Maryland, there is a license for a behavior analyst. Um, so most students who go through our program, program and become board certified do go on to become licensed behavior analysts, which is essentially very easy to do. You just need to pass the BCBA exam and let the board know that you are now board certified. And then um, you, we also have an additional 14 graduates that also includes Leslie and Jackie who are preparing to take the exam. Most of them, I think we've had a few people have taken the exam already from the sixth cohort and have passed. Um, and then most students because of the pandemic are not actually able to take it until October. Although um, the BACB actually now offers the exam throughout the year. In the past, they've only offered it three times a year. You can now take the exam and my understanding, um, Jackie and Leslie, you guys can correct me if I'm wrong at the end of this, is that they, um, you can get your scores and find out if you passed right away. Where in previous years, 
when I took the exam way back when, you actually had to wait like six weeks before you got an answer if you passed the exam. So you can find out immediately if you passed it. Okay, next slide. Uh, a question I get a lot is, who is your ideal candidate? So I've identified a few things that we're looking for in our candidates. One is really a demonstration or desire to commit to the field of applied behavior analysis. If you are entering this program to get you know, a couple more letters after your name and additional certifications, this may not be the program for you, but if you are really um, committed to the field of behavior analysis and want to learn more and want to become a board certified behavior analyst, um, this is the program for you. Another piece is understanding all of the requirements to become board certified. We help you, we guide you along the way, but once you graduate from this program, you're responsible for knowing all of the requirements for becoming a BCBA. Um, there is something called continuing education credits that all BCBAs must um, complete every two years. Um, as, as professors, once you graduate from the program, we are here to support you on any of those questions, of course, but it is your responsibility. We will not be reminding you to, um, to renew your certification every year. Another uh, thing that we're looking for is an ideal candidate is uh, an individual who is who has the ability to commit to two to three years of intensive graduate coursework, um, demonstrating all of the admissions requirements, which Liz is going to review with you in a few minutes, and above all else, willing to work and study hard. One thing I want to mention that I think Leslie mentioned in her review of the program or discussion of the program is that we follow a cohort model. Um, so all students who come into the program in the first semester go throughout all the courses together. Um, and you've definitely seen that. Um, you see the friendships as, as the professors stand back. We can see, we can see the friendships that are formed across the cohort. Um, and then we also see folks talking about their experiences in their different educational settings um, and applying what they've learned from their peers. And then finally, um, what's been really nice that I see every single year of this program of our graduates is they create their own study groups um, and that helps them prepare for the exam. Usually two or three people will work together once they graduate from the program and um, meet with each other and study and uh, are well prepared, obviously well prepared to take this exam. And I think Liz, I'm turning it back over to you to talk about admissions. Great, thank you. Um, thank you so much, Leslie, Jackie, Dr. Martyr, um, and very kind of motivating and inspiring um, kind of testimonials about the program. I'm going to speak a little bit about admissions application requirements, but I wanted everyone to get their questions ready um, in about five minutes, we're going to open it up for question and answer time. Um, so if you could, would like to begin thinking about your questions and typing them into the chat room. Um, as far as admissions application requirements, at a minimum, we do require for this program that you have earned a bachelor's degree and master's degree. And the master's degree is specific to, um, and Dr. Martyr will correct me if I'm wrong, special education, education, applied behavior analysis or psychology. Um, we do require that you have an overall 3.0 or better uh, cumulative undergraduate and graduate um, grade point average. And really the application form, it all starts with our online form. And in our online form, you, we ask you to upload a essay or a personal statement, uh, your resume CV. And in the application, you're also asked to provide the email addresses and names of two um, academic or professional recommenders um, of which once you enter their names and emails, they're automatically sent a request to provide a letter of recommendation for you. Um, aside from that, uh, then you submit your application and then immediately we ask that you order your official transcripts uh, to be sent from all post-secondary institutions attended, both undergraduate and graduate. Even if you have transfer courses from a school, you may have taken summer courses. We do require all original transcripts to be sent to us in the admissions office. Um, once all of these are received, and only when they're received, is your file considered complete and ready to be reviewed by Dr. Martyr and the admissions review committee. Another thing I like to point out is that this does not require the graduate record examination admission to this program. It's not applicable to what you're learning um, and it is a post-master's program. So there is no GRE required. 
Liz, if I can jump in real quick about the master's degree, mm -hmm. the requirements for the new requirements for the fifth edition, you are required to have a master's degree according to the BACB, but they are no longer specifying the type of field. Great. So you could have a master's <laughs> degree in education, you could have a master's degree in social work, um, you could have a master's degree in speech and language pathology. So it's really opened up, um, whereas before it was only education, psychology, or ABA. So I just wanted to make sure that that was um, pointed out that it just has to be a master's degree from a qualifying institution. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Barter. Good change. Uh, so um, for our international applicants or anyone who is internationally educated, um, there are additional requirements. If you are a non-native English speaker, you, we do require an English uh, proficiency test. Um, and if you, you know, you can look at our website it has very detailed information on this. If by chance you have earned your academic credentials outside the United States or Canada, we do request or we do require rather that you have an evaluation service provide us a course by course evaluation. And again, uh, detailed information is located on our website for anyone who may fit that particular situation. Okay. Um, in terms of tuition and fees, um, for face-to-face -face master's programs, as Dr. Martyr had highlighted earlier, for due to the COVID-19 pandemic, all courses will be online for the fall 2020 semester. Um, the cost per credit is $833 per credit, um, so that's uh, $2,499 per course. We do have registration fees uh, each semester that you're enrolled and the $80 application fee. Um, this does not include additional uh, costs for the practicum courses will become available um, on our school's website, so we'll invite you to go out and take a look at that. Um, for financial aid, this, this program is eligible for federal financial aid, which is graduate loans. Um, about 82% of our degree seeking uh, students do borrow some form of federal financial aid. And the first step to do so is to complete the free application for federal student aid form. We do have, again, detailed instructions on our website should you need them. Um, one thing I often encourage anyone looking to, uh, who is submitting an application or in process is you can absolutely fill out your FAFSA form at any time in the process. You do not have to wait till you've received an official offer of admission. Um, your FAFSA form it will not obligate you to anything until you actually enroll and you accept an offer from a school, but it's good um, kind of piece of paperwork that we, we definitely encourage um, anyone who's an applicant to complete right away. We do offer a limited number of partial institutional scholarships. They're called our School of Education Endowed Scholarships. They're available for fall and spring uh, academic uh, semesters only. Um, and our application deadline is April 1st. And then I also wanted to point out that our external scholarship resources, I'm noticing more and more um, kind of um, scholarships appearing for uh, special education and behavior uh, analysis on these sites, scholarship.com, teacher.org. Um, those are external um, scholarships that you can apply for from different foundations. And certainly from time to time, we do have grants um, that are available to help support students. Um, and we usually make announcements of those grants when they become available. Um, one thing, uh, lastly, before we get started with question and answer, strongly encourage anyone who is interested in fall 2020, it is not too late to apply. However, we do encourage you to move quickly so that you can meet um, what will be, is this our eighth cohort, Dr. Martyr? Yes. Are we, on, we are on number eight, if you wanna become part of that. Um, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, this is program offers fall admission only. So fall 2020 is the next available opportunity. Um, we'd be happy to um, follow up with you in a phone conversation, individual consultation if you need assistance with the application. Um, and before we move to Q&A, uh, Tanya McMillan um, is our admissions coordinator, so she works very closely with our ABA applicants, and as is Camilla Makis sims who is the program coordinator. She, once you become a student, Camilla is your point of contact. Um, both are here to support you through the process in any way that we can. Um, so with that, I will open it up for um, question and answer. If you'd like to, we'll take a minute for anyone who would like to type a question and we'll read it aloud in our, uh, in our chat box. 
um, Dr. Martyr and for Leslie and Jackie, I, this might be a, a, we'll see who would like to take this question, but uh, with my one question, what is the approximate time commitment, reading, research, and preparation outside of course time? <laughs> oh, that, I think that's a good question for Jackie or Leslie, because I can tell you what I think it is, right. uh, but I think they have a more practical experience. So maybe how much time did you guys spend a, maybe a week studying or per day studying or preparing for class? Um, this is Leslie. I guess I can take this one, Jackie. Um, I, I would say it depended on the week. It depended on the week. Uh, I would say the, the first the first semester was we put more time in it probably I don't know if Jackie agrees agrees with that because everything was so new um, but I'd say probably an average of I mean I, I was work we we're working full time also so I think a lot of us were, were dedicating a lot of our time during the weekends and I'd say I'd say maybe weekly readings about an hour or two and then in the in the weekends I would probably be spending you know three to four hours, maybe. I don't know, Jackie, what do you think? Yeah, I was gonna, I was trying to do some math in my head. Um, I would tend to agree with that. I do think that uh, looking back, and again, it's probably because it was so new, the first semester um, seems like the heaviest amount, and it definitely ebbs and flows week to week. But um, I think it's important to note that it is a time commitment. Um, but once you kind of develop a schedule and if you can really figure out a schedule that works for you and your family or, or your lifestyle, that sticking to that will help you in the long run. Um, but I would say I would spend an hour to two hours um, on the weeknights reading after work. Um, and then the weekends were predominantly I would spend doing papers or whatever the actual like homework activity was. I would say that's pretty accurate. Yeah, and just to just to pipe in, I um, it, it, the Jackie, the the making a schedule is, is and of what you're gonna do and becoming, you know, it it was harder. Like I said, it's it, it's harder at first, but then really once you get that schedule in your mind, and it does ebb and flow. So there are opportunities if you can look at look in advance and say, okay, this is a weekend where this is a lighter weekend. I mean. It did, it's a huge time commitment, but it, it didn't. I'm a mom of three boys, and I work full time, and I, you know, I was able to make a schedule that worked for me, where I was still able to, you know, ha be with my family and and do things that were important to to my life, my life as well. So, I just having a schedule is is really really a good idea, and what we all did, what worked for us. Yeah, and I, you know, a majority of the um, the students in our cohort were were parents, well, I guess moms, we only had one one male in our cohort, but um, who worked full time and um, as well, and I, I don't have children, but I did plan some major milestones while doing this and, and I was able to make it all work. So it is manageable. Great, thank you so much. Um, I have another question. Um, Dr. Martyr, could you re-review your the benefit of the 1500 practicum hours versus 2,000 practicum hours um, that you covered in the previous slide. Yeah, so, you know, the 1,500 hours, obviously the biggest benefit is less than 2,000 hours. Um, however, um, I think the benefit of that is that the concentrated experience, you get supervised, the requirements you have to be supervised at least 10% of your hours. Um, I may be quoting that percentage wrong because of the new requirements, um, but, um, but what it comes down to is that you actually get supervision twice a week, um, not only from the individual supervisor, but also from the group supervisor. So I think that's a really important piece of the concentrated experience. You know, people get excited because it's less hours, um, but it's actually concentrated, it's more intense, um, and it allows you to get um, really the extra attention um, as you're going through your practicum experience. So that would be the benefit of doing the concentrated hours in general. Um, I think the benefit of doing it with us is that we have the curriculum that goes along with our practicum courses. We have assignments um, within each practicum class. And then we also have our individual supervisors that who are trained by us to provide you with supervision. Great. 
So just in terms of a follow-up, the benefit is the 1500 hours is more concentrated um, and it, you uh, are doing that through Hopkins, through our practicum coordinator, whereas the mm -hmm. 2000 hours you would be arranging on your own, correct? Yeah, so I, I was actually looking at this uh, this morning. You could actually do concentrated experience on your own as well, but you have to find the supervisor um, and you have to pay that supervisor um, to provide you with that supervision. Unless you work um, or, you know, are employed in, let's say, an ABA agency that provides, that has BCBAs on site who do provide that supervision. Um, so you, you, in the past, you had to do um, practicum through a university. That's not the requirement anymore, um, but our practicum will allow or does align with the concentrated field experience hours um, and then we do provide that um, we do provide so you're not actually paying for a supervisor you're paying the tuition for the course but we've done some calculations and looking at the cost of paying for the course versus paying for it on your own and looked at with some of those hourly rates so doing it um, through a core sequence like we offer with the practicum electives would actually be um, cost efficient for our students. Great, thank you. I have a question from Amanda. Um, can this coursework be applied to continuing education needs for teachers? And do you also offer continuing coursework to maintain your BCBA certification? So two great questions, Amanda. Um, I'm going to answer the second one first, and then I'll come back to the first one. The second one of offering continuing coursework to maintain certification, we do not currently offer that, um, but that is something that we have been exploring, um, especially now that we have so many more graduates from our program. We want to support our alumni, so it is something that we are exploring. Um, we're also exploring that as the School of Education is exploring offering more continuing education credits to alumni. So it's something that we will explore the coursework being applied to continuing education needs for teachers. So if you, I'm assuming your question is about if you're already a certified teacher and you have to take coursework for renewal, I would say that that is definitely a question to check if you work in a public school setting to check with your certification folks within the public schools. But I don't know, Leslie and um, Jackie, do you guys, have you been able to use the coursework for um, continuing ed needs as a certified teacher in Maryland? Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> I've, I've been able to. That's great. Okay. Cool. Yeah, same here. And, it, and if you're, I'm not sure um, who you work for, but if you're thinking of like your, your credits towards your pay, it would also apply towards any of that as well. Right. So okay. this would apply for like, if you have a master's plus 30, like this would, this applies for my master's plus 30. I'm just short, like three credits, three credits but, right. but everything right. will count towards it. Yes. Great. That's good. To, I didn't know that. So now I learned something new today. Thank you. I think our next question is really for Leslie and Jackie. Um, both of you described during your uh, during your your talk that this really as your your current teachers, classroom teachers before you started the program and a new skill set. How has it impacted your um, your role with students? Where do you where do you feel you've made huge kind of uh, impact? in the classroom using kind of behavior analytics uh, skill sets? Kind of a broad question. I, this, this is Jackie. I can start. I, I actually, um, I think one of the things that stand out the most to me that might sound very small um, is actually in regards to data collection. Um, I'm not sure if you're a special educator or a school psychologist, but I didn't feel that in my undergraduate or even graduate program that there's really even any discussion of um, how to collect data, let alone the different types of data collection and even why you choose one over the other. And I feel like that's something that you're kind of thrown into as a special educator um, and just hoping that somebody teaches you that or you learn on the job, but it's such an important part of what we do. And I feel as if that's like a huge learning takeaway that I, I, I would like to be able to train more people on um, and kind of focus in on that. I mean, there's a million other things, but that's like a, no, a number one thing. Uh, I don't know about like, like, Yeah, Jackie, I would agree with that. That was actually one, one that I was going to say as well. The data collection was always very difficult for me as a classroom teacher 
you know, because we're, we're so it's it's but it's so and I think the importance behind the data collection and, and why it's so meaningful and why it's so important. I agree with you on that. This coursework really does teach you the not only the importance of it, but how to collect how to collect it in a specifically in a, in a, in a way. And one of the things that I think that I this impacted me with working with specific students. So right now I consult in classrooms, but so what happens is that students are, I'm no longer in the classroom, but I'm working with students with severe challenging behaviors in their general education classrooms. So I consult with special educators, but I work directly with students as well. They're referred to me um, by the special educators. But what I found is that, you know, as I used to teach and I would walk around and we used call it our bag of tricks, right? Like we would have our bag of tricks where this behavior is occurring, oh, it's attention to me, so it's our bag of tricks, we're gonna pull it out. It what's impacted me most after this coursework is that I don't consider myself to have a bag of tricks anymore. And I really consider myself really looking truly at evidence-based interventions and really looking back at the science and the research and looking back and observing and looking at the kids and really truly understanding the functions of behavior and, and, and the environment and all of the variables that go into that to truly create an intervention plan that's going to be successful for, for students rather than just pulling out my bag of tricks. It's really looking at the evidence and I think the importance of that and what makes behavior analytic work stand out as something so amazing is that it is scientific and it is based on evidence. And I think that's that's and, and 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 seeing it work and seeing it be successful, I think, is what's wow. So I think that's I know that was kind of broad, but that's that's my that was my biggest. That yeah, was my I'm gonna, biggest. Sorry, I'm going to jump in and say one more thing in regards to there is um, everything that you learn in this program, you will be able to apply to your classroom and to your life. Um, as a professional and just as a person. So every single thing that you learn, you will be able to take away um, and apply. That's such a powerful statement, Jackie, and it's it's so true. It's helped me as a parent as well, as well. I just look at things completely differently and, and help and apply. It's unbelievable, powerful statement, Jackie. Agreed, wholeheartedly. Thank you both. That um, uh, was a great explanation. I think that as concluding our questions, um, I can leave it open for a little bit longer, see if anyone has a last minute question, but do want to emphasize that uh, we are still accepting applications for our fall 2020 cohort um, and very easy application process. You could start your application at education.jhu.edu uh, backslash apply now. Um, and certainly can set up a time um, we're available to assist you with the application or if you have questions about um, curriculum or cost and we'll, we'll send up a follow-up of this recording to post today's uh, session. So we really look uh, forward to connecting and hearing from you um, and happy to do so as is Dr. Martyr. <clears throat> so we're looking at uh, August 26 will be the official start of our fall semester. Again, it will be online due to the COVID pa pandemic. Um, and, you know, hopefully we will see many of you uh, inspired to apply. And thank you, Leslie and Jackie, so much for your guidance. And we wish you the best of luck as you prepare or have taken the exam. I'm not sure which, but uh, good luck. Um, and thank you for being with us today. Dr. Martyr, did you have any final words? No, I think that's it. I look forward to um, hearing from all of you. I'm here to answer any questions, either through email or on Zoom. And I also want to thank Jackie and Leslie for joining us today. Thank you so much. All right, everyone, have a wonderful evening.